We've chosen the prestigious Royal Johannesburg in Kensington to be the venue for our interview with Ewan Murray, Sky commentator extraordinaire. Ewan Murray, we hear his voice whenever we're listening to the Majors or the World Championships, the Ryder Cup and the President's Cup, and of course, the Nedbank Golf Challenge. Ewan Murray was also a terrific player. As a junior golfer, he won the Scottish Boys and the World Junior Championship. As a professional, he won a couple of tournaments on the African Tour. But what interests me about Ewan is that he grew up exactly the same way that I did. His dad was the professional at Babington Golf Club in Edinburgh. And Ewan grew up in the golf shop and alongside his father when he taught golf. He's got some interesting stories to tell. So it's time now to join Ewan Murray. Let's start off with how you got into the game, the early days in Edinburgh. Well, it started, I guess, at Glen Eagles. My, my mother worked in the hotel at Glen Eagles, and my father was the assistant professional to Jack McLean at Glen Eagles. Came to Babbitton in the early 50s, Babbitton just outside Edinburgh, about five miles to the west of it. And he was pro there for 35 years. So my youth was spent, not at school, but at the golf club. And did you spend much time, you know, with your dad in the shop, teaching, watching how he taught people? He was a very good teacher. Uh, he taught some of the, the best amateurs that were around at that time. He was very much a, a club professional, like your own father. And my youth was spent virtually either on the golf course or in the pro shop. And uh, you, you yourself, you were, a, you were a terrific junior golfer. Yeah, I, uh, well, I was very lucky to have him to, to guide you along in the, in the formative years, which are so important. Um, I did have a good junior record. I don't quite know what happened after that, but I had a, a spell where a, the game seemed fairly easy and, and I was reasonably successful. Well, reasonably, that's an understatement. You won the Scottish Boys and then you went over to America to play in the World Junior Championships. First time out of uh, Edinburgh was on a jumbo jet over to Los Angeles. And I remember landing there and, and looking out the window thinking, this is, this is a much bigger <laughs> place than I'm used to. But it was a great experience and, and a wonderful thing to be able to do at that age. And of course, they still do it today. Who were the, some of the players that played in that World Junior? Craig Stadler uh, is the one that stands out. Craig won the, the main event. Uh, 17 years of age he was then and he looked at 17 the same way as he looks now at 57 or whatever he is. And his son doesn't look very different either. His son is just a younger <laughs> addition, yes, but very successful uh, earlier this season. Uh, Kevin Stadler getting his first one in the PGA Tour. But Craig Stadler stands out. Uh, there was two twins from Hawaii, the Baron Abbott twins. They were very good players as well. But uh, I never heard of them after that, which surprised me. Straight off that you turned professional. I did. Things were different then. Uh, it was difficult to, to play amateur golf unless you had money. You needed um, entry fees, you needed transport to get there, you needed hotels, and we didn't quite simply have that money. Uh, I didn't fancy working for a living, so, <laughs> so I turned professional. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned professional on November the 1st, 1971, just after my 17th birthday. And those early years on the European tour were fun. Now, I'm thinking of some of the characters, Brian Barnes, Tommy Horton, Morris Bembridge and Malcolm Gregson, and of course, Neil Coles, a great player. I mean, those, those years were wonderful. They were. Uh, there was a dozen players who, who could win around that time, and things have moved on from there. You've now got maybe 50, 60 players that could win at the start of a week. But the people you mentioned were part of a team that I was involved in, British Caledonian Lions. And we were very lucky because with the airline contract, we could play in the winter in South America. We came down to Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Nigeria. And if we didn't have that contract, we wouldn't have been able to afford to do it. So we traveled as a team and they became great friends. And even to this day, Brian Barnes is my next door neighbor. But not only were they, were they terrific players, but they were great characters. It was fun to play the tour in those days. Yeah, and they were great life coaches. Uh, Di Reese, I remember, was, uh, was my chaperone. 
And he left me at the airport in Nairobi and I never saw him again for four weeks. <laughs> but if you were under 18 in these days, you had to have a chaperone and Di Reese was, was the man for me. And as I said, they were great life coaches. They taught you how to behave. They taught you how to behave in people's homes because we didn't stay in hotels then. We stayed with members of golf clubs, which again was a, a great experience. And many friends were made down the years. Now, you, you mentioned diaries. Uh, people watching this show would more than likely have no idea who diaries was or someone like Neil Colt. Well, Neil's uh, coming up 80 and, and still playing great golf now. Rhys was a, a fiery Welshman, uh, as you know, who had a great Ryder Cup record. He went on to captain the, what was then the GB and I Ryder Cup team before Europe got involved in, in the present day Ryder Cup. But uh, they were great players, uh, great players of their time. And if you look back in the history books, you'll see a lot of mentions uh, of Di Rhys and Neil Coles. Your successes as a professional, you didn't win uh, on the European part of the tour, you won, you won down in Africa, but uh, you came close a number of times. Something let you down. Yeah, I, um, I had a putting problem at a very young age. I had a putting problem at, at 15. I remember the date, the time, the course, when something happened, an involuntary movement in, in my hands. And I got over that fairly quickly, but it was always in the back of my mind and it came back. and. And I struggled, uh, I struggled to hold putts from 18 inches, two feet. The long putts weren't a problem, but, but I did have a, a serious problem from short distance. That almost sounded like you were talking dirty, an involuntary movement in my hands. <laughs> it was dirty, it was what, very what, dirty, it was what, ugly. <laughs> what, what actually, what do you mean by that? What actually happened? I, I remember it was the first green at Long Nidri Golf Club, which is down near Muirfield. And I was off at 8.20 and I had two shots on the first green. Seven, eight feet away and thought, well, I'll just knock that in for a birdie because that's what young kids did. They never thought they were going to lose, never thought they were going to miss. And I saw that the backswing was short, it was jerky, it, was, it was, had no rhythm, no flow. And I spent the whole day trying to hold putts from 15 inches and tiny backswing and, and came home and wondered what had happened. I mean, I'd read about yips and... You know, Ben Hogan and Sam Sneed. Sam Sneed was a side saddle man to try and get rid of that. So it's happened to good players down the years, but I couldn't figure out why it happened to me, but, but it did. What difference would it have made to your life if you discovered the long putter at the age of 15? Oh, enormous. I mean, I did get over it and, and, and I, I got to about 31, 32 before it came back. But if I'd had the long putter then, my career wouldn't have finished at 35, 36. It probably would have been extended. You keep yourself relatively fit. I think golfers are fitter today. So your career is longer. And then you have the added bonus of playing when you're over 50, which uh, you didn't have then. Golf was very fortunate because after that group of players, the Barneses, the Hortons, etc., came probably the most exciting group of players that Europe has ever had. Seve, Lyle, Faldo, Langer, Woozy, and uh, you played right through those two eras. Yeah, two very different eras, because when Seve lit up the, the European tour, he came at just the right time. The European tour went on its own in the early 70s, led by John Jacobs, and it was difficult. It was extremely difficult. There was a, a body of players in the PGA that didn't want that to happen. There, there was people against it, people for it. And Seve pitched up in 1976, just when we needed a superstar, and, and superstars don't come any greater than him. Sponsors became easier, his charismatic smile, his, his swashbuckling style, uh, it was just perfect for that time. And without that, I'm not sure the European Tour would be what it is today. That, that was a very significant moment in its history. Let's not forget Tony Jacklin. Also, Tony Jacklin, uh, that was uh, just before the transition of the, the European Tour, um, winning at Royal Lytham, winning in Minnesota. Uh, no one had ever thought that was going to happen. And, and Jacklin was at the right age too, right in the middle of, of his 20s, uh, best 10 years coming up straight after that. So yes, Jacklin was, was very important at that time as well because he was still at the top of his form, although he wasn't going to go on and win another major. He came close on several occasions and stayed around for a long time. And Jacqueline was the, 
the boy next door. Uh, his father was a lorry driver, Jacqueline was the boy next door that came and conquered not only the Open Championship, but the, the American Championship as well. So, yes, Jacqueline first, but Seve just at the right time. Can you just staying with Jacqueline a second, he was robbed of two majors. At the, at the, the Open at uh, St Andrews, when it started to, we had that huge thunderstorm, and then uh, at, at um, Muirfield, when Lee Trevino chipped, the, chipped it in from off the back of the green. Yes, especially after Trevino had handed it virtually to him, because that's the way Trevino was. He, he spoke all the time. He, he bounced around uh, like a rubber ball. And, and Jacqueline could have been forgiven, I think, for what happened, but he let his guard drop at that time. He chips in, Jacqueline chips on at 17, three pence, and, it, and it's gone. But I think you're right, the most significant one was St Andrews when he went out in 29 and had that golf course by the scruff of the neck and momentum halted. 67 in the first round eventually, which was only an average half-decent round. It looked like it was going to be something an awful lot better than that. And Once that momentum was broken, uh, Jacqueline's chances went west. Now, uh, we're going to get to your, to your television life, your second life, let's, let's say. But uh, Henry Longhurst said something about Jacqueline's round there that I thought was very significant. He said, it's as if the gods of St. Andrews have sent this rain to protect their course. And that's exactly what happened because he was headed for a 62 or a 61, wasn't he? Maybe even better because he was playing high on confidence and he'd got through the loop, he'd got the scores on the scorecard and it was benign. There was hardly any wind. So the last five or six holes were nowhere near as difficult as they can be. So it could have been something even better than that. But Henry was probably right. Another player that played in your time and that you've worked with in television is Peter Oosterhaus, who South Africans, older South Africans would remember well because I think he won our Order of Merit three times in a row. And he did pretty much the same in Britain. He did four in a row from 71 until somebody from South Africa in 75 came over and I can't remember his name, big guy, not much touch around the greens. But you broke that run of Peter, he, he had four in a row there. Well, the only reason I broke the run is he went to America. <laughs> <laughs> I was being very modest, I think. But Peter was a, a fine player as well. Really should have won a major, came third in the Masters, was very close uh, at Royal Troon in the Open Championship. And in the end, it was the Canadian Open that he, he won in the PGA Tour. But Peter was a, a much better player, I think, than his record suggests. Probably should never have gone to America. Probably not, uh, because... Seve was about to pitch up, the European Tour was about to get momentum, but he went before that happened, so you could understand it. The Ryder Cup through the 70s, before, as you say, GBNI Ryder Cups, um, it was a huge thing for British players to make those teams? It was, but it was like lambs to the slaughter. Uh, I mean, it was one-way traffic for, for a long time because we didn't have strength and depth. We had the players you talked about earlier, the, the great players like the Barnes and the Hortons and, and Neil Coles and, and whatever, but we had no r real strength at the tail end of the team. So when in, in 1979, Europe became unified with GB and I, uh, that was the rebirth of the Ryder Cup and Jacqueline was very much involved shortly after that in where the Ryder Cup is positioned in the game today. That um, uh, the Ryder Cup, was that something that at the start of the year that went through your mind, you know, I need to, I need to really try and play well because I want to play in the Ryder Cup or was that not really a goal for you? It was for me because the Ryder Cup in 81 was at Walton Heath where I was attached to, um, I was there for 16 years and that was my goal for two years, was to, to get in the Ryder Cup side and play at Walton Heath, but it didn't happen. Let's talk about the change in the Ryder Cup now, when the Europeans joined. Well, you have strength from, from all over Europe now. You, you have a unified Europe that are taking on the United States. The first thing they had to do was get results. And in 81, the strongest American team ever came to Walton Heath and another resounding victory there. Jacqueline changed things around in 83 when he became captain. They came within a whisker uh, at West Palm Beach. 85, uh, the pictures of Sam Tons. Anyone who plays the game today or has played 
for that length of time will we'll see Sam with his arms raised and, and the tears in his eyes. And, and that day, the Ryder Cup changed because Jacqueline had taken them on with the European Tour players and he'd wiped the floor with them. And, and he'd changed the mindset of, of European players. He'd, they'd talk about cashmere sweaters and Concord. That made a big difference because it gave our players an awful lot more belief than they'd previously had. Sam Torrance uh, was kind of the right person also at the right time. He seems to have sort of made the most out of things like that moment at the Ryder Cup, winning the Ryder Cup when he was the captain, etc. The winning of that uh, Ryder Cup and the style in which it was done, uh, it was the one that was delayed sadly for the, the atrocities that the United States had over in, in New York. But Sam coming in in 2002 was ideal. Uh, a player who had tremendous amount of experience, a man who had great Ryder Cup experience, understood that it was a, a tough competition, but had to be a fair competition. And, and Sam was one of the great captains of the Ryder Cup side. And I, I was thrilled along with everyone back in Europe that he would be a winning captain and not a losing captain. Very passionate man. Very passionate, uh, and he will be involved in a couple of months' time when, when they go to Glen Eagles um, for the Ryder Cup there. Tom Watson at the, the helm for the United States, and Sam will be a vice captain this time. So, very important to have that experience. I think McGinley's made a pretty good choice with Sam and, and Des Smith. Do you think it would be unfair for me to say that in the 70s when we were playing, we were completely intimidated by the Americans? And that sort of changed through the 80s and then into the 90s. We were intimidated, but you could see why. Our tour was five months, six months long, first prizes of, of not very much money. More than that, if you finished fifth or sixth, you were just about covering your expenses, maybe making a few bob here and there. The Americans had a, a great tour then. They had a tour that lasted 10 months uh, of the year. They had big prize funds. So they came from the top table. And, and we came from the back of the room. So there was a big gulf between the two, but that gulf was to narrow very quickly with the success of the Ryder Cup. And I think, I think the Ryder Cup was the reason that, that that changed. And not only did it change for, for the young British players or the European players, it changed for the, for the entire world. For sure, and you talked about a golden era that the European Tour had. Now, that coincided virtually. We had Seve certainly to start with, and we had Sandy Lyle winning his major championship. Uh, but then we had Ola Thabel. Then, then we had a German called Langer. Who would have said that a German pro would have come and, and, and wiped the floor with the, the players in the United States at Augusta? You know, their hallowed ground. And others started to believe in themselves. Faldo then came on the scene and with his determination and the great successes, he had six majors. But it started around that time. And if you look back at the Ryder Cup, when Europe joined forces together, Players from all over Europe started to play well. We've got good French players now. We've still got very good Spanish players. We've got young kids coming out of, out of Germany again. Um, Martin Keimer became a, a major champion. And then it all started from, from that era in the early 80s. If, if I go through those names again, Faldo, Langer, Lyle, Woozy and Sevi, just give me your thoughts on each one of them and... Try and list them in terms of who do you think was, were, were, was the best of the lot. Well, I'll start at the top. <laughs> uh, there was only one, Severiano Ballesteros. Uh, he, uh, he was a remarkable player. He had a great connection with people in the game, which I think is so vitally important. When you look at the sponsors that put up money today and, and have done down the years, very important that the players connect with them. Seve did that better than anyone else. Uh, I don't need to say much about his game. Five major championships. Uh, he was the Pied Piper. He was the one who went out there and, and everyone looked at Seve and thought, hero, superstar. You know, I want to follow in his footsteps. Woosnam was probably one of the best drivers of a golf ball that I've ever seen. Uh, with the old Bellata and the, and the persimmon head, which a lot of young players don't understand today. I mean, it wasn't difficult then because that's what we had. But uh, 
it's a lot easier to play the game today. Wisdom and probably Greg Norman were in a, a, a league of their own as far as driving the ball was concerned. And I was thrilled that Woosnam became captain of the, the Ryder Cup side and made such a great job of it at the K-Club in 2006. Uh, so Woosnam was a, a good companion as well. He was, he was a lad you enjoyed playing with. 